Yeah, there is what we're going to talk about today. Lessons for Mexico, Humanity, Ecology, and Mushrooms with Zach Hunter. Now, um, first, I'm going to run through a few bit of uh, house cleaning things, and then we'll do a proper introduction and turn Zachary to this on, on this presentation. Um, number one is let's talk a little bit about what you can do during this session. You'll see you have a chat, uh, chat function in there. We encourage you to chat, chat with each other chat uh uh you can chat privately with each other or you can click everyone and send to everyone i want to point out many people leave the default host and panelists like uh georgie i see you just did that uh uh we only zachary and i can see what you just said georgie because you said you know greetings to hosts and panelists so look at who you're sending the message to uh, and send it to everyone and feel free to have conversations in there during during this if you want to ask zach a question though he probably won't be watching the chat so much uh the q a is the right place to do that because we store all those questions if i see something really timely i can interrupt him and ask him otherwise we can answer at the end so if you have a specific question you want answered um by zach shoot it shoot it in there please in the in the q a we are recording this it will go up onto our youtube channel and on our webinar page on our website within the week um so look look for it there uh meanwhile coming up talk about some upcoming events of course we have nama mx and zachary's going to talk about that today that's in august and we have namazona that's in arizona in august as well and that's going to be a culinary focused event over over a weekend at a kind of a swanky little little resort with with really uh we think pretty pretty high end and special food i think it'll be a little different event than what we normally do plus all those arizona mushrooms are fabulous um i don't have to pump up the mexico one because zachary's going to do it for like the next hour uh, and then we have our Pacific Northwest NAMA Camp. That is our annual event happening in Randall, uh, Washington this year. Uh, that says Randall WI. That is clearly a typo. That is Randall WA. Uh, uh, I'm going to go to the next, next one real quick uh, for those of you that didn't see it. Uh, that's in Washington. So hopefully we'll see you at some of these events and you'll see some uh, some, some announcements coming. Now we've got two, two virtual events coming up this Friday. We have our... Fungi Film Fest, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have, I think, 20 uh, uh, short films about uh, fungi, and it's put together by Peter McCoy and the Fungi Film Fest, and he shared it with us, and we've made it available to our members. It is $5 to, to come and watch this movie with us, but it's, a, it's an awesome event, and we'll have Peter there for some Q&A afterwards, and hopefully it'll be a little different kind of Friday night for, for people that want to uh, soak in some mushroom films uh, 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 in just a few days. And then we have a nice webinar coming up on truffle cultivation with Stephanie Jarvis, uh, on March 6th and, and more stuff. So, so watch for that. Now I want to talk a little bit about Zach just to introduce him and get him going, uh, here. And I, I put a nice bio up here. You can, you can read that. Uh, I'm not going to read that to you though. I'm just going to tell you I met Zach a few years ago at SOMA, that is the Sonoma uh, Mycological Association camp. It's a cool event that happens out there in January. And I think I've probably now hung out with, with Zach at three or four SOMAs since then. Mm -hmm. um, and I always, when he teaches a class, I always go to it. Um, he is a, a wonderful presenter and he knows so much about mushrooms and not just like from a chef standpoint, uh, he's traveled the world. He has extensive knowledge of mushrooms in Thailand and Mexico. Um, he, he's a fabulous chef, but, but he really approaches mushrooms, I think differently and likes to talk about their flavor compounds and really almost, it's almost like you have an, an intellectual and spiritual connection to, to mushrooms and you love to talk about them. Um, I I, I, it's pretty <laughs> impressive so uh, uh uh the other thing is if you're in a room with a bunch of mushroom experts uh zach can hold his own he knows a lot about mushrooms not but, a mycologist <laughs> not a mycologist but you have a, a lot of practical knowledge and you're you're very clearly very well informed on mushrooms so i i, I really i really think we are going to enjoy what what he gives us today and i would encourage you if you get a chance to uh, go on one of his forays and uh, see him speak elsewhere, you avail yourself of that opportunity. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Amy is not in the scene here, 
that's his his partner and and wife and and also is part of the team so uh here we go i'm gonna go now i think to my final slide before i turn it over to you uh zach you can take over uh, any time you want and continue with the presentation okay. I'll, I'll mute myself and go away all right well then let me get started oh, oh look at that <laughs> um well, uh, hey everybody, I think you may have seen me on the video earlier. I can answer questions uh, with my video as well. For now, I'll just keep it from here. Um, as Trent said, my name is Zachary Hunter. My wife, Kim, and I have a company, two companies actually. One is the Fungivore, uh, which does, we do uh, Mexican mushroom adventures. We do everything but psychedelics. So dying mushrooms, edible mushrooms, uh, inviting mycologists to come uh, and, and sort of explore what we can find in the area. Um, and we are, this is the beginning of our fifth season doing mushroom tours, which is really exciting in Mexico. Um, so that's really exciting. So our, our company is called The Fungivore. Uh, we like to believe that these trips will change your life, um, mainly because it's exposing folks to a brand new way of being. And that's really what this lessons from Mexico is all about. Um, Kim and I have been living here in Mexico for almost two years. March 15th will be two years living in Oaxaca. We intended to move here in 2020. Um, some things happened as you may have been aware of and we had to postpone for a couple of years, um, but we are here now and um, it's really been an awesome experience. I mean, this country is magical, at least for us and uh, has really, it's really in a really fantastic place for what's happening globally in terms of mushrooms and mycology and knowledge and, and the rights of indigenous. Um, and I think Mexico is in a, in a really good place um, going forward. We'll see how that transcends. This is an election year in Mexico as well. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like it'll be one of two female presidents uh, come July. So we'll see what happens there. Um, so what is there to learn anyway? Um, I, I, wanted to put this in there just because the perception of how we approach mushrooms sometimes becomes a bit monolithic or, or we don't even realize that we're stuck within uh, a certain viewpoint. So let's take a look at at least my interpretation of how the U.S. Uh, and I assume Canada being sort of uh, very similar uh, to the U.S. approaches mushrooms. And that is uh, official positions kind of varies from state to state. I know that uh, one of our members of the culinary committee in NAMA has designed a uh, what mushrooms, what edible mushrooms are allowed to be sold in restaurants. And, and as, a, as a picker slash seller, you have to pass certain uh, tests in order to be able to do that. That's in Rhode Island and in and, and some of uh, some other states. Uh, the U.S. doesn't really have an official position on mushrooms. Um, some national parks you can get access uh, to pick in and others no. Um, public perceptions are obviously changing. Literally, they'll ask anybody about mushrooms and the first thing they're going to think about is psychedelics, especially now uh, that the corporate world has kind of gotten into that and Michael Pollan's written his book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, you it's not uncommon to see several wild mushrooms at, you know, maybe a little higher up uh, grocery stores. Um, throughout mushroom season depending on where you are and then places like at least in Oregon I saw some Oregon folks there Fred Meyer uh, will definitely have several different types of mushrooms or it used to be only brown mushrooms so I think the public perception of mushrooms and their safety is changing uh, more and more people are going foraging all the time um, and one of the things is, as demonstrated by this talk is that there are a ton of organizations and opportunities in the U.S. and Canada to learn more about mushrooms. And that is uh, a really big deal, actually, because if you can go and find a local organization from it's the potato guy, I don't know if you all heard that. <laughs> uh, if you can find a local organization in your state or in your city, uh, you can be exposed really quickly to a lot of people that know more than you about mushrooms. And, and it's a great opportunity uh, to learn more and it often opens up even more opportunities with that. I mean, the fact that I'm currently addressing a wide variety of folks from all over the country or all over the US 
uh, is absolutely fascinating. And I think it's amazing that we have this kind of organization uh, and sort of interconnected network of, of nodes, you know, associations and groups, and also larger groups like NAMA, not to mention tons of groups that aren't part of NAMA and are, are kind of doing their own thing. So that's kind of a big deal. Associations, organizations is kind of a thing. Um, pros and cons of that. Uh, the pros, I, as I just went over, it's a great way to easily find a group of people that share your interests. Um, and that's that can be really beneficial. The con is that the folks who love mushrooms and are studying mushrooms often aren't the ones in power or the ones controlling the forest or the resources. You know, I've, I, I can't even count the number of times I've gone back to a chanterelle spot to find a clear cut. Oregon is known for just, you know, letting them have it. Um, and so that's really difficult. So there's a con. The con there is that, you know, you can be fascinated with mushrooms and something of it, a little bit is unpredictable. And unless you're going through a university or you have specific access to an area, you may not be able to go back to the area a ton of different times. Um, in my life, I've been lucky to uh, be in Oregon for the 25 years that I've been picking mushrooms. And, and so there are spots that I've been able to observe changing and shifting over time. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that it, it, it takes it takes years to develop that anyway. I, I, I got very lucky just being in a mushroom rich area. Um, but that's one of the cons of, of the organizations and organizing around knowledge. Um, so let's take a look at Mexico's approach to mushrooms, at least how I understand it. The official position is a bit unfortunate uh then in fact there are there have been signs produced do not pick wild mushrooms recently uh it's sort of the the mycophobia still is is uh kind of controlling what the governmental approach is luckily no one does a lot of what the government says here and <laughs> sort of his freedom has has more of a free free spirit on their minds um public perceptions completely shifts uh, depending on where part of the public you're in. Um, Mexico is is extremely um, varied and wide, and I'll, I'll get into what I mean by that soon. But depending, if you're in the indigenous communities, the public perception is we've been picking mushrooms for a thousand years. We know all the mushrooms and they're fine and they're great. And they even eat mushrooms that we don't eat and eat mushrooms raw that we don't eat as well. Um, if you are, I mean, like everywhere, the whole world is sort of coming into mushrooms and, and mushrooms are becoming in vogue pretty quickly spore chic if you will um so public perceptions are shifting in the cities um but generally speaking it's it's we're, we're mexico is coming out of a micro a, a mycophobic position uh for the masses or for the i guess the westernized uh part of the country now as far as organizations and opportunities this is where the US and Canada have a uh, sort of a jump or a lead on Mexico. There are not really associations in Mexico for mushrooms. There is the uh, national uh, organ, their national uh, mycological association, which is mostly universities and professors and really sponsors events that put on for PhDs. Um, but there really aren't associations here. And that's been something as, as we bring more, more Mexican members into NAMA, one of the one of the idea the, the thought was oh we can have individuals or organizations join but that's that's actually a very U.S. and Canada based approach. Um, there the organizations here are actually entrepreneurial organizations. A lot of the twenty to thirty year olds are starting businesses to help people learn how to grow mushrooms to sell mushrooms from the communities. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a different uh, it's a little bit of a different uh, way of of how the public can get involved. And as a result, there aren't a ton of opportunities actually for people who may have an interest in mushrooms, but don't want to go to university uh, and don't really have, you know, they don't know where to go. Um, and so obviously that's a pretty big con. Now, the pros of this is that the indigenous communities have thousands of years of history with mushrooms and are also the caretakers of the forests, or I should say, the forests that are left that have the mushrooms are usually in the caretaking of these indigenous communities. Um, and so in this sense, the folks that are know probably the most about the mushrooms of the area, um, at least from a traditional standpoint, also are the ones that have access to the forest. And those are the people uh, that you have to pay for guides and to ask questions. And, um, and so there's some pros to the idea that the most mycophilic also are the ones controlling the forests. Um, and so that's that's my quick overview. We're going to get into a lot more of this. But let's talk about Mexico just a little bit. Most of you, I assume, know that Mexico is our southern neighbor from the U.S. I say ours. I actually live in Mexico now. Um, and 
what you can see from this map, the topographic map, is that while we have the Rockies and Oregon, the Coast Range, and uh, you know the Appalachias and Great Plains, Mexico is pretty much the extension of those mountain ranges and nothing else. Um, most people know about Mexico for the beaches, um, and that, as you can see, is you know the the entirety of the perimeter of the country, much like the U.S. But the country itself is a huge. Uh, mountain plateau called the Altiplano. Um, and in places like Mexico City and into Puebla, you, you're on flat ground at 7,000 feet, similar to Wyoming, you're up, you're up in the mountains. Uh, and then the beaches are, you know, the edges, and there's jungle, and then the Yucatan itself obviously is a massive jungle as well. Um, there are several major mountain ranges of, Cal of, of Mexico, the Sierra Madre Oriental, which is the east, the Alta Plan the Alta Planesi, uh, which is the sort of center, uh, almost the extension of the Rockies, almost all the way down, almost to uh, where I live here in Oaxaca. There's the Sierra Madres that continue sort of the coast range and the Madres from California uh, down the west coast, and then there's this really cool the the, vol the volcanic trans the transverse volcanic line uh, has um, I think three or four of the top ten tallest volcanoes in North. America in North America, all in a line right near Mexico City. It's a very really cool spot. Uh, and it's one of the only places where the mountains don't have trees. Because unlike uh, unlike in, in Oregon, for example, there are pine and fir forests going up to 11,000 feet in Mexico, um, which is fascinating, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, the climate regions of Mexico kind of follow, as we saw before, the jungles tend to be quite hot and wet. The mountains uh, tend to be very tall and wooded. And then the, the Alta Plana is fairly deserty, right? Most people think of Mexico as a desert, and it's true that actually cactus come from this continent uh, and agave as well. Um, so the climates actually has every climate that, uh, well, sorry, um, has every climate except for the tundra. Um, and uh, Mexico, as a result of that, is extremely diverse. Um, it has everything from cropland to jungle to tropical forest, temperate forest, uh, and a whole bunch of desert. And it has a monsoonal rainy season. So the rains come in the summertime, depending on where you are in the country, that can be as early as April uh, and as late as November. Uh, where I live in Oaxaca, it starts around, we get some rain in, in April, a little bit in May, and then June, there's usually a big first dump. And then July, August, September is very wet. Uh, and obviously mushrooms require rain. There's a lot of wood wood rot fungi in the jungles, as you as you'll see in, in jungles all over. Um, but Mexico is a mega diverse country. It kind of switches in its uh, in its position of the top five in the country, um, with Colombia and um, I think India and I can't remember the other ones. But it's uh, estimated that Mexico has something along the lines of 10 to 12 percent of the world species and these are endemic species that are from here in particular um which is kind of a staggering thought if you think about it mexico isn't a super important country in the world is not a super politically uh, powerful country in the world and yet eco uh, ecologically it is one of it's, it's almost one tenth of the diversity on the planet um which is absolutely stunningly amazing um, considering that there is at least some efforts, both presidents or both the both presidential candidates are very strong in environmental concerns. Um, and so it, no matter who gets elected, we can look at Mexico moving more progressively towards preserving uh, this incredible diversity um, of flora, fauna and funga. Um, found this uh, kind of cute map. I think it's a little wrong on the fungi. It is a uh, exponential map, but it kind of demonstrates what we just said, that Mexico has about 10 to 12 percent um, by numbers as, as far as mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and is just it's worth exploring every part of it. And it, wow, it's so slow. You know, <laughs> we're in Oaxaca. I'll be talking about the state of Mexico here shortly. Um, but this this is an incredible country with a lot of diversity if you're into anything other than mushrooms and mushrooms uh, as well. So one of the things that is also diverse about Mexico and very lucky, uh, I suppose, in the way that history turned out is that there are over 400, maybe even over 600 languages still spoken 
uh, in people's home villages, um, and uh, which is incredible. Um, one of the reasons for that is the Aztec Empire had uh, in 1520 from 1519 when Cortez showed up on the shores of Mexico, uh, the Aztec Empire had basically taken over all of the Central Valleys at that point. Um, and so the Spanish kind of took over for the Aztecs and saw a lot of parishioners and a lot of people. And while there was obviously intense brutality and all of the things that come with brutal occupation, uh, unlike in the US and Canada, the communities are actually still, a lot of them are still on their native land. And uh, while they had the same 95 to 99% die-off rate because of disease, uh, unlike the US, they weren't moved around as much um, and taken off of their land. And a lot of them still speak their native language on their native land. Uh, and some people have hundreds, if not thousands of years of ancestry uh, in their area. Um, that makes Mexico a valuable, uh, a valuable place uh, for recognizing some ancient history that's been erased in a lot of places around the world. Um, in fact, uh, the first Americans may have arrived in this, this continent as early as 30,000 years ago. Uh, this is a, a cave in uh, Zacatecas. It's more in the north of Mexico, um, but there's some caves in Puebla as well. Uh, they just found a 27,000 year old uh, carved mastodon bone or giant sloth bone, sorry, uh, in the jungles of Brazil. So I think we're, we're actually also at a precipice of rewriting what we think of the history of this continent and that it's probably much, much, much older and much, much more involved uh, than we have given uh, consideration to. So I just want to put a little time perspective because we're going to be talking about some bigger numbers here. Um, the U.S. in two years is going to celebrate 250 years of existence. So I want everybody to think back to your memories of 1776, which you don't have because it was a long time ago and a lot of things have changed. So when we're talking about 30,000 years or a thousand years or you know several hundred years of existence, just keep in mind how much happens in that time, how many people come and go, how many different uh, political figures, how many different orators come and go and consider how much we still have to learn from an area that has at least something of an oral history for thousands and thousands of years. And not to say the U.S. doesn't, it's just, at least in my life, it was not highlighted nearly as much as it sort of is here in Mexico, uh, which I think is absolutely fascinating. So a little bit about Mexico, of course. Uh, this is a cradle of civilization. You know, people talk about Greece, or they talk about Rome, or they talk about uh, the Fertile Crescent or China, and they sort of conveniently leave Mesoamerica out of that conversation. And I would love everybody to leave tonight's talk, if nothing else, with an understanding that we are, this continent also had a cradle of civilization. Um, so people may know or may not know, corn or maize is the most grown crop on the entire planet. That was cultivated by the early Oaxacans, actually. Uh, these are some of my photos. Uh, they, these are cave paintings at Mitla. They have been dated to about 12,000 uh, BC. They were also found um, seeds of pumpkins, some early beans, and also the, the Tiacinte bean transiting into becoming maize. These are all things that were cultivated and created here uh, in Oaxaca, where I am right now, but also that quickly caught on, or quickly, over several thousand of years, caught on through Mexico and became the staple diet. Um, so people have some ideas of what came from the New World. The slide isn't very pretty, but I just wanted to list these real fast. Um, People probably know chilies come from here. Tomatoes and you know all nightshades, in fact, come from here. Chocolate, vanilla, squashes. That's the the cucurbita squashes. So you know pumpkins, uh, beans. You know not lentils, but uh, beans. And then you probably haven't heard of chico sapote, um, but that's where chewing gum comes from. So if you didn't know, chewing gum was actually uh, invented in Mexico a long time ago. Uh, it's called chicle and chiclets. The name chiclets actually comes from that. And then some fruits, you know, avocado, papaya, guava, agave, peanuts, 
uh, Cherimoy and Soursop and Amaranth are all from here. These were all cultivated by the original folks that occupied this land uh, and that were, you know, discovered uh, by Europeans, you know, some 500 years ago, despite having been around for 12,000 years or more. Um, so just keep in mind that this is a this is a very, very important place for the entire globe. Like what would French France be without chocolate and vanilla? What would Ita Italy be without tomatoes or Thailand without chilies? Um, so consider just how important Mexico is and, and uh, as we go through this. I had to put the slide in here um, because the, uh, the people of rural Mexico also uh, eat a lot of insects. And these are actually all, all my photos. Uh, what you're looking at is escamoles in the far left there, that is ant larva. Um, once they're cooked up, they're a bit like cottage cheese. Of course, there's the chapulines, the grasshoppers. And we learned this last summer that you have to eat them because they'll eat your garden if you don't. Uh, up in the top is the worm, most, made famous mostly by mezcal. Uh, and the worm that's left the gusano, left in the back. That's actually because they are agave worms and they live inside uh, the pincas or the leaves of the agave. Uh, and then on the far right there, that is me holding up chiquitanas. Chiquitanas are the leaf cutter ant queens that emerge out of the ground for one day, usually maybe two days in the whole year, uh, and are um, looking to start their new home. Uh, and the first big rain kind of flushes them out and they're a delicacy here and they're ground into sauces and salsas. Uh, as far as other things that are coming from Mexico, the fermentation in, in Mexico is phenomenal. And I used to joke, and this is when I was completely ignorant of what existed in Mexico, that a lot of the cultures that we consider cultured, say Korea, Japan, uh, use cultured foods. And as it turns out, Mexico has 16 unique fermented beverages. Um, this paper that I have, the, the highlight there, you can find that online, um, gives a very, very detailed account of the bacteria, yeasts, and uh, fungi and other beneficial molds that are associated uh, with a lot of these ferments. Um, and of course, this is for health, this is for sanitation, this is for uh, expanding the nutrition profile of, you know, pineapple skins, for example, for tapache or pulque, which is uh, the sap from uh, the, the pulquero uh, agave, one of the one of the varieties of agaves. Um, waiting. Uh, it has also now been floated that Mexico may have the oldest record of distillation in the world. Um, there's a video called, uh, I have to find it, I'll, I'll put it in the chat at the end of this, um, but it's a video about these, these uh, folks in Calima, which is on the coast, on the west coast uh, of Mexico, and they found, they unearthed their um, 3,500 year old uh, doubled clay distillation pots, um, which is in what you see in the upper right there is actually still being used uh, in, in Puebla. Um, and these are all some photos from around Oaxaca and Puebla and elsewhere. This is our very good friend Octavio who makes some incredible mezcal. Um, and this is because agave, has, uh, agave is endemic to Mexico and there's 119 species of endemic agave here. And it was one of the main sources of food. When you roast it, it becomes very uh, sugary and sweet and, and can feed a whole village. When you let that ferment, uh, it becomes slightly alcoholic. And if you have a double clay distil distil distiller, then it can become mezcal. Um, and so the mezcal, uh, Mexico may also be responsible for the earliest distillation in the world. You know, and all of this kind of culminates in what Cortez found. Um, Cortez, when he arrived, found in terms of, of what some of, the, some of the Spanish described as one of the most beautiful, cleanest, incredible cities they'd ever seen in their life. Something like walking into an alien place with plumbing and aqueducts and no sewage in the streets. And of course, we're talking about Tenochtitlan. Uh, if you go visit this website, you will not be disappointed. Uh, this guy, Thomas Cole, has created a full 3D mapping of Tenochtitlan um, and has even overlays where you can slide Mexico City back and forth over over from different views, uh, has some views at sunset, ideas of what the canals would look like and its magnific magnificence as a city. Um, and that's sort of the culmination, you know, if you will. The Aztecs are often given a lot of credit uh, for what happened in Mexico. The Aztecs sort of came onto the scene in the early 1300s. Um, and by the time Cortez arrived, we're the dominant culture just 200 years later. So actually in less time uh, than the U.S. has been around, um, the Aztecs came to full power uh, and had basically taken over the entire country. Most of the names 
uh, of, of cities and, and towns and things here are in Nahual, which is uh, the, the language that the Aztecs spoke. Um, and that was how Cortez found it. But now we live in the modern world. And this is Mexico's political map, if you will. Mexico has 31 states plus Mexico City, uh, which was formerly the District Federal. Um, I think that is, DFA has been retired. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the state that sort of surrounds Mexico City. And you can kind of see it. I don't know if you can see my pointer in here. Um, but you can kind of see this sort of a uh, horseshoe or oblong horseshoe shape of a state that is the state of Mexico, not to be confused with Mexico. It's actually called just Mexico, but it's it's called Estado de Mexico um, and not to be confused with Mexico City, obviously, or the country, Mexico. So this is the state of Mexico. As you can see, there's a little portion that's been carved out there for Mexico City. Uh, the largest city within the state of Mexico is Toluca, which is actually the capital of the state. Um, and those little um, dots on there are some of the archaeological ruins um, that I've marked on my map. Um, and this is where we were. This my I'd been in Valle de Bravo before, which you can see uh, over here on the far uh, left of the state. This is actually where we stayed for the Nama MX uh, twenty three last year uh, and did some foraging in these in the areas around. Um, so just an overview: uh, the most widely spoken languages in the Estado de México, obviously besides Spanish, are Mazawa. Uh, Nahual, which is the language of uh, the Aztecs and others, Matlatzinka, Tlahuica, and Otomi. Um, there are several others. Um, and Toluca is uh, a, a farming area. There's tons of folks that come from Oaxaca that speak Mixtec and Zapotec and Mazatec and every other language that shows up. Often families will move together. And so there's obviously a huge representation of the whole cross section <coughs> of languages. Um, but Mazawa was one of the communities that we got to hang out with last year. It is on the Otto Pomanian tree, uh, which is not the same language tree as the as as Nawal, as the Aztecs. Um, Otomi and uh, and um, Matlatzinka are are also related to Mazawa as well, whereas Tlahuica and Nawal are part of the same family tree. Um, and so there's evidence of lots of migration of lots of shifting as i said try to remember that you know the, the omex appeared somewhere around 3000 bc so we're talking you know 5200 years ago or so um and they're considered sort of the the mother culture of all of, of mexico they that's where the quetzalcoatl uh serpent comes from as well as a lot of some of, of the building styles the ball game that's kind of famous in ancient mexico um but just keep in mind that within that 5,000 years of history, there's been a lot of movement, a lot of interchange, a lot of exchange, a lot of folks breaking off and becoming isolated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here in Mexico, uh, we are friends with several Zapotec folks from different communities, and they do not speak the same Zapotec, not even dialects. It's, it's a different language. Um, it is, yes, it's still Zapotec, but they don't understand one another. They use very different words. Um, so the languages are very important here. Uh, and I just, in doing some research for this talk, I just wanted to point out, uh, so we've zoomed out quite a bit now. The state of Mexico is is uh, is just there in the middle. Uh, and we're, we're zoomed out looking at the states of Queretaro, Guanajuato, uh, Tlaxcala, Morales, Puebla, Michoacan. Uh, and all of those blue dots are actually the Otomi structures. These are our platforms, pyramids, old cities, um, you know, ceremonial grounds. And, and we're talking about a massive area. This is probably five hours driving uh, by car uh, from one corner to the other and, and on freeways going 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. This is a huge area. Um, but there's no record of the Otomi actually ever having an empire similar to the Zapotecs or the Mayans or the Aztecs. Uh, and so it has been floated that this area, because it's such a central area for all the valleys, that the Otomi were sort of the mother's the mother trading culture. They, they would uh, bring in goods from here and there and probably had a massive knowledge of the entire continent and the resources that are there. Um, and lest you think this is all old. This is the current Otomi ceremonial center. Um, it is not ancient, although it has been made with a nod to what their ancient sites look like. Uh, I think it was um, 2012. It's pretty new, actually, maybe 2002. Um, but this is, is sort of a nod. This is in the state of Mexico as well. This is sort of a nod to how important these cultures were and are uh, and, and still remain. And, and I'll show you why in, 
why for our purposes they're so important um this uh, right now, I'm looking at San Antonio de la Laguna, uh, kind of blown up there. And they, if you look on the right hand picture, that is the forest that we hunted in last year with Anama, um, the Mazawa speaking community of San Antonio de la Laguna. Also, hosts they were hosting their seventh annual mushroom festival, um, and they do this only for the local people. Actually, they are um, they, they don't advertise it to the public. It's something that um, some of the folks in the area just want everybody in the village to be more educated about ecology and about mushrooms. Um, so, you know, the, the landscape in this area, I've only been able to describe it as rolling mountains. You, you might think rolling hills, but these things are so tall and so wooded, um, but they're still softened by, by time. It's really an absolutely stunning area. And I've been told it extends for almost 1400 kilometers through Michoacan, almost to the coast. Um, we've only hunted in such a small little area and the variety is stunning. Um, the Tlawika folks, we are going to be visiting them in 2024 with the NAMA MX24, um, as far as as far as I know. And uh, but they were their partners with our program director, um, and so they presented during our show and told us uh, during the the event last year and got to tell us about their history. Uh, some of their members have gone on to become uh, they have bachelors in mycology and are uh, exploring and, and exploring the diversity of their area as well. This is a stunning um, spot in Mexico. Uh, the Lagos de Zempaola are right next to this. It's sort of a winding mountain. It kind of reminds me of if Marin County got blown up a whole bunch. There's just lakes and forests and really gorgeous um, winding mountain roads uh, at about 9,500 foot elevation. Um, and the Tlawica, the Comunidad Kikaku, if you can, you want, it's actually much simpler than it looks. Pikaku um, is living right at the base of this mountain. And we've driven through here a couple times. Um, absolutely just stunning, stunning area. The Tlawica, for those who are familiar with Mexico, just uh, south, if you look on the map on the left, you can see Cuernavaca. Cuernavaca is a fairly large city. Um, and that used to be the center point for the, the sort of smaller uh, Tlawica empire that existed and controlled a lot of that valley. They were eventually conquered um, by the Aztecs. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, Tlawica is also based on Nahual. Uh, and so there was a lot of the Nahual language already being spoken and the Aztecs also spoke that, but sort of became the dominant force uh, in the area. Um, let's see, and then finally, Matlatzinka. Now, Matlatzinka used to be the empire that controlled the entire Toluca Valley, which is everything I showed you in the state of Mexico, generally speaking. Um, and right now, this community that you see, San Francisco Oxtotopan, is the only Matlatzinka speaking community left uh, in Mexico. Um, they do have schools. They teach Matlatzinka to their to the school children, along with Spanish as well. Uh, they are extremely myco mycophilic, um, and as you can see from the pictures, their mountains are immediately outside of their cornfields in their village. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to go here. One of the mycologists that we worked with from Mexico has been uh, working with these guys for for, for several several seasons, uh, if not even a decade. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this is because they have a very extensive knowledge. All of these communities have a very extensive knowledge of mushrooms, of ecology, of patterns of nature, uh, of when things are coming up. They, it's all in their language. They, they know the types of mushroom, the parts of the mushroom, how mushrooms help the trees. Their, their ecological knowledge is deep and intact. Uh, and that's a really, really, really cool to, to think that we actually potentially, with their permission, have access to information that is older than any of the science that we have. Um, of course, bringing science into it is also important because having, uh, especially with the work that Fundus is doing and mapping um, the genetic sort of diversity that exists, uh, gets, this is also very important. I'll get to that in a little bit about what I think the future holds for some of these communities. But these type of papers, which you can look up pretty easily on Google, uh, if you want to look up scholarly articles about the so-and-so people, you'll find these papers in Zapotec, in, Mas in, Ma in Mixtec, in, in Mazatec, in Otomi, in Nahual. Uh, the, the ethnomycology is sort of what really makes Mexico so unique. And that is a nod to the fact that these communities still exist, they're still functioning, they still have this knowledge, and it's with their humble permission as stewards of the forest that, that we can actually expand 
even greater the the, the the public body public knowledge of mycology and of mushrooms uh, and hopefully to the benefit of everyone. Um, in Mexico, there is extensive use of mushrooms for uh, as edibles, obviously, um, for medicinal uses as well. In fact, um, there are something like 440 um, medicinal plants and mushrooms that are used in the in the Mexican Medica, uh, which is second only to China. Uh, there's about 394 edible species that have been edible species of mushrooms or mushrooms, I should say, mushrooms that Mexicans eat. Uh, that have been recorded here in Mexico as well. Uh, and by per capita, that actually makes Mexico the number one consumer of varieties of wild mushrooms, even over China. China has about 640 varieties, but they also have 7 billion people, or however many, 1.3 billion people. Um, whereas Mexico is 127 million. That does make Mexico the, the top Spanish-speaking country in the world, um, but they have a vast an incredible connection to their ancient medica, uh, as well as to the edible mushrooms. Um, as as folks probably know, uh, spiritual and healing, the psychedelic mushrooms were first um, discovered, isolated, however you want to call it, here in Mexico as well with Maria Sabina, the, the Cubensis mushroom. I was just reading Gordon Wasson and his wife uh, Valentina's accounts of their first time in 1954, uh, consuming the, the psychedelic mushroom. That is not to say that the psychedelic mushrooms come from here, uh, but the first uh, strains of Cubensis were first synthesized, well, were first um, grown from samples taken from mushrooms here in, in Oaxaca, actually. Uh, and there are a ton of varieties of psilocybes here in Mexico that have been used traditionally um, by a lot of different cultures. And I think that it's a, a case of um, probably parallel evolution. I'm not sure that there was one mother culture that necessarily uh, used them or not. Um, but uh, there's also what I love, this is my favorite word, there, there are distinct examples of Mexicans using mushrooms for what is called ludic purposes. And what that means is, here, throw this puffball at your sister, or which one of you kids can gather the largest uh, earth star today? Uh, and ludic is sort of to play without purpose, but they're literally using mushrooms to enroll kids and in getting involved in ecology from the time that they can walk. Uh, and so there is this huge gambit of how mushrooms have been used in Mexico uh, for thousands and thousands of years. And it is, it is taught. It's something that's still being taught uh, within, with, you know, within the, the communities today. Um, just in the last, I don't know, five years, I would say, a ton of mushroom festivals have popped up. And a lot of times it is the communities that are hosting uh, these mushroom festivals. And this is all over Mexico. Like during the rainy season, if you come to Mexico some weekend, there's probably five or six mushroom festivals happening at any given time. And that's because the season is so short. So people really pack them in. Um, Sorry, I was getting the wheel of death here. Um, gastronomy and mycophagy is huge, obviously. Edibility is probably the number one concern for mushrooms. Um, one of the coolest things we learned this last year at NAMA MX was about a community that, that uh, eats elven saddle raw. And, you know, this, there's this idea, and this is one of the cons uh, of our associations and of, of our sort of knowledge and science-based things is we say, oh, you can you can eat those raw. I had no idea, and the answer is no. You can't eat them raw uh, because they have hydrazines in them, and they are toxic. And uh, you should leave hydrazines for for rocket fuel, right? However, if your community happens to live at ten thousand five hundred feet in elevation, and the mushrooms you pick there are also at that height, the volatile chemical at that altitude actually volatilizes and is no longer in that mushroom, and so. When it comes down to what can be eaten raw, what can be eaten at all, it is incredibly regional. And that's sort of the, the level of detail of knowledge that a lot of these groups have. So what we see, we're like, oh, that's neat. I didn't know that. Well, it's only applicable because humans cannot be removed from the ecology in which they live. And that's one of the issues, this the hands-off sort of mission of preservation is actually dooming the planet because we're telling people to leave stuff alone and people have been the keystone species on the planet for 2 million years. Um, we, we have been altering and changing the planet for a long, 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 long time. So to remove us from it really doesn't make sense. And in fact, does the opposite of what we want. And I think that in Mexico, you can really see 
how involved the people are the you know humanity and ecology is completely intertwined um one of the mushroom festivals that uh actually some folks on this uh that are in this call got to go on as well rima i see you uh was the fiesta de los hongos mixtecos this was like many festivals it had you know presentations at an id table we had a daily foray but the highlight of this was it was a two-day festival one one overnight the highlight of this was that on sunday they had 14 chefs from oaxaca and puebla and around who have some of the best rest literally some of the best restaurants in, in mexico if not in the world uh came together to cook over coals and did like a 14 sort of rotating course brunch for three or four hours and it was one of the most fabulous fabulous things i've ever seen the the edibility of mushrooms is incredibly important as is fiestas here and this some of the images uh from the mushrooms being cooked uh you know their prep kitchen was a woman boiling water over over wood fire uh my wife kim and cheshire marison from the cascade cascade uh, mycological society in eugene um got to do a little dye demonstration there as well uh this this little uh this little young woman i should say in the upper uh right knew more about mushrooms i swear than anyone else at the entire festival uh mycology latin names everything she'd be like nope not yep, 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 yep. It's really really fascinating and super super incredible um and so, you know, mushrooms are celebrated here. Um, now, lest you think that that doesn't mean there isn't science here as well, of course there is. Uh, the the um, National Society of Mexican Mycologists, or the Sociedad Mexicana de Micología, uh, has been around actually for only one year less than NAMA has been around. Uh, NAMA was founded, I think, in 1957. Um, and I think uh, the Mexican Society of Mexican Mycology was just like the, year, the year after that. So there's been a parallel uh, university uh, movement as well as uh, you know the public movement happening at the same time. I, I immersed myself in this in uh, October of 2022. Um, I traveled down sort of, I, as I said earlier, I'm not a mycologist. I, I came to mushrooms as a chef. I am science interested. I, I was raised by uh, some pretty strong science uh, parents. Um, so, so that's always been sort of my passion, but I do not speak uh, phylogenic trees. I do not speak mycology. Uh, and at this time, I really didn't speak very well Spanish either. Uh, but we went down to Chiapas and I went to this event. I was the only gringo there besides uh, Bryn Den Dentinger from Utah, who was is the only presentation in English. I was so over my head. And I got to meet some of the most incredible mycologists whose papers I'd been reading in English. Um, and that was actually one of the, the things that fomented the NAMA event happening because once I got access uh, to some of these folks, they were really excited to share what they had with myco curious folks from the US as well. Uh, and that's sort of how this all came about. Um, NAMA uh, MX23 was was my idea and my mm -hmm. creation, along with our partner Iriri uh, Men Monter from uh, Symbiopsis Viva de, la, Viva de la Fonga. She is um, an entrepreneur and CEO of her company in Mexico City, uh, who sells wild mushrooms, is connected with communities and also with a bunch of the chefs uh, in, in some of the best chefs in Mexico City as well. She was our program director last year and this year. Um, so that's extremely exciting to be working with her again. Um, and so because we were partnering with mycologists from Mexico and because we had Brooke and Nama, we, it was actually quite a, a science forward event, um, as, as a lot of these events tend to be, right? The presentations, people are very excited about the new Rusula species they found, or they're very excited uh, about, you know, how to, how to demonstrate DNA barcoding, which is important. We'll get to that in a second. Um, Nama covered a lot of that. And, and I'm really proud of the fact that we managed to uh, put together a program that covered everything from indigenous practices and rights and, and some, some language all the way through vouchering. Uh, we're still working on the species list, but uh, there were several hundred that were found over the three different foray areas. Uh, we got to go and experience uh, the chefs at their restaurants, as well as host them uh, for a panel to talk about their personal experience uh, as a chef cooking mushrooms. You know, uh, Brooke Reed and uh, and others um, ran a really amazing vouchering program. And so working with the communities, we really got to take a capture a moment in time. And for those of you who don't know what vouchering is, 
I'm with you. I just learned sort of last year uh, the importance of this. And I'm really excited to see that catching on because basically you're capturing a moment in time. In th on this day, in this environment, in this place, this is the mushroom genetics that we found. Um, and it, and it, by drying them and preserving them and studying them and holding them in place and really and keeping them in institutions like uh, the um, University Autonomania of Mexico or UNAM uh, and in the Chicago Field Museum, which are the two organizations that we had partnered together uh, for this event, it really does lead to this the genetic heritage that a lot of these indigenous communities uh, have a right to. Um, and so by utilizing like this crowdsourcing or a group effort to get everyone together, uh, this is really helping advance some some of the mycological knowledge that's going to be really important going forward. Um, we had a uh, three nights of presentations and panels uh, during the event. It was really phenomenal. Uh, we had our translators. We had folks uh, going into the same phylogenetic trees as you do in in English as well. Uh, we had stuff about the actual communities and their practices, uh, the geography, the ecology, uh, some new ideas. There were a couple new mushrooms that were being presented as being named. Um, so really an exciting sort of, if you're into the knowledge, you got that. If you're into the food, we got that. And then we got to go and foray in three different locations, which was absolutely stunning. Come on, computer. Uh, this was the first one. This is with the Mazawa community. This is Danya Sisi uh, in the pink in the upper center, blessing uh, Kate Blanis as we go into the forest, asking permission from the forest uh, to pick the mushrooms as well as to enter the forest itself and to come out safely. Uh, and some selections of the of the many different mushrooms that we found um, during that that hike as well. Um, really phenomenal and literally in the town. You know, you actually walk down the road from Danya Sisi's house and into the forest, uh, which is pretty Amazing. Uh, Santo, San Francisco Oxtotopan, our community with the Matlatzinka, um, are not are, are not only really into mushrooms, they've also been working with mycologists, like you see up at the top, Dr. Roberto Guerra Bay uh, is uh, with his head down, um, missing the hair there, and this is with the Matlatzinka community in San Francisco Oxtotopan. Um, a ton of Amanitas, a lot of very different forest uh, than San Antonio, San Antonio, uh, um, further up some really, really gorgeous Amanitas, uh, Bolites. Uh, unfortunately, during our foray, at least on my day, it started, it opened up and poured down rain and we had to cut it a little short um, because of the dumping and the fact that we came up a mud road to get to it. So not immediately out of town. It took about 30 minutes or so uh, to get there. Um, but still an incredible variety of really beautiful and incredible mushrooms. And finally, the grounds of the, of, of the resort itself actually proved to be the most diverse uh, of any of the 4A areas. I had to throw my gratuitous uh, bathrobe shot in there because uh, we found some of these incredible oyster mushrooms, the stocked oysters in the spa, as well as a chanterelle and some other mushrooms as well. Um, the 4A, the, the hotel grounds itself, Rodavento, I, I visited for the first time in dry season in April of uh, 2022. Um, and my first thought was, my God, there must be so many mushrooms here during the rainy season. And I asked one of the groundskeepers and I was, he was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. We'd love the mushrooms here. And I was like, I'm going to do an event here. I don't know how, I don't know when. Uh, and then that's, that's basically how the NAMA 23 sort of conceptualized. I started talking to Trent and some of the folks and I was like, guys, found this amazing place. Uh, and as it turned out, you know, there were people finding Amanita, uh, Caesar, Caesar Amanitas right under their cabins. Um, people come walk to their, their, their uh, rooms and come back and be like three mushrooms in their hands. Be like, look at these. <laughs> I mean, really, really absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think that the, uh, in the far upper left there, Ele Eleanor Shavat is holding this incredible uh, frosty eye. I can't remember the first part. I just want to call it a bully, this frosty eye. I know it's not anymore. Um, this is why I'm not a mycologist. The Latin names escape me when they change so rapidly. Um, but yeah, the, the the event itself, because of the forays and the exposure to mushrooms in these communities, we really got a wide swath of the variety of mushrooms that are available. Now, we also got one of the best shows of culinary uh, that um, it's a dream of mine as a chef to be able to put together not just um, a, a great panel of people to talk about mushrooms, but folks that also cook mushrooms and so we got to visit several of these folks restaurants uh have their cooking 
Um, Mateus there on the far left is actually making make some Matsutake beer as well as the lactose indigo, indigo beer, a lactarious indigo beer. Uh, Chef Rodrigo actually figured out that uh, using nixtamalization, which is the process of boiling something in lye, which they do for corn to make tortillas. Uh, if you nixtamalize your lactarious indigo, it preserves the color mysteriously, um, which is just absolutely super cool. Chef Laura Cardenas uh, is, uh, runs a restaurant called La Petahaya Vigana. She serves uh, oyster mushrooms. Uh, I think more oyster mushrooms than anyone else in the city um, through uh, her pink her pink tacos that she's become quite famous. Um, uh, Chef Rafael Riviera uh, is a fermenting expert and has all kinds of really interesting ferments going on, uh, as well as running a coffee shop and a bakery. Uh, Chef Daniel Friedman's a very good friend of mine and is uh, a caterer and has been cooking in Valle Bravo for almost 30 years and was sort of our chef program director. And then Chef uh, Joaquin Cardoso from Loop Bar uh, is uh, one of the illustrious, he's actually a former two-star Michelin chef in, in France. Uh, he is Mexican. His his history is is very long and, and incredible. And I'm really happy to say that Chef Joaquin and Chef Laura Cardenas are going to be running our food program for NAMA MX24. So that's extremely exciting. So last year, I actually finally got to do a sort of hands-on group cooking exercise. And uh, I'll just play this video and you can kind of see what it all looks like. Are you guys like providing out uh, aprons? Last year they had some aprons. Let me see what I can find. Okay. Several. This is used only in a special occasion, and they use it a lot in so this was uh, an incredible experience. They, you know, we we purchased a ton of wild mushrooms from the local Hungaras. Uh, Hungaras are the female mushroom pickers. Um, for those who speak Spanish, you may not have heard the verb honger. Uh, H-O-N-G-U-E-R. It's actually the verb to pick mushrooms. Um, it only exists in Mexican Spanish, actually, which is um, pretty incredible. Uh, so there are hongueras and hongueros. Uh, and the, we purchased these, a lot of the wild variety of mushrooms and allowed the chefs to sort of grab what they wanted uh, to make their dishes. And everybody, if they wanted, could participate or you could do a real quick thing and sit down with your glass of wine. That was a bit of the settings uh, for Nama 2023 that just really kind of, I just, my goal is to melt away that difference. I don't want there to be a, a much distance between chef and eater, between the communities and the folks. I, I, you know, I really like to see everything meld together. And this was an amazing opportunity to do that. And this was sort of our, you know, uh, dress rehearsal. So with Joaquin and uh, Laura taking charge and both Chef Camacho and uh, Chef Efrain uh, from Rodavento really on board this year. I have no idea what we're going to happen this year, what's going to happen this year, but I know it's going to be over the over the top. Um, check out Nama's Instagram page uh, for a profiles on both Chef Lara and Chef Joaquin. I think you're going to be blown away uh, by their credentials. But that, oh, come on now. That was our Nama MX23 event. It was uh, absolutely just a stunning and exciting, um, exciting part, an exciting time for us. And I'm really stoked to be doing it again this year, just because Mexico, you know, this is the last time we'll do it in Valle Bravo uh, because Mexico is so huge. Um, but we're already being asked to uh, look at some other states to bring Nama and to bring this kind of curiosity and geekery with us. Not done yet, Trent. <laughs> um, so some things that are new uh, for NAMA this year, um, we've decided to include the spa circuit as part of this. It's a luxury hotel. It's kind of a stunning way to do mushrooms. And because, frankly, we found mushrooms in the spa area. So uh, this is going to be open. We'll have two full days at the resort this year uh, to explore the grounds and to, and to play. And the spa is part of that this year. So that's really exciting. I did want to shout out, though, because I'm white, Trend is white. A lot of people are here are probably the same. I did see someone from Sri Lanka on there. Uh, we have a problem 
folks, and that is that we we sort of insert ourselves thinking we can be a hero or a savior, or we can just sort of jump in on something because, hey, this is what's happening now. And I just want to say that in the past in Mexico, there's been examples of when microtourism did overwhelm communities. Uh, and right after Gordon Wasson and Valentino Wasson's articles came out, um, there was a huge hippie pilgrimage to the town of Huatla de Imanes. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't even realize this, but they basically set up a commune only a few miles from this, you know, tiny little uh, Mazatec Mexican town and were swimming and being naked and enjoying free love and doing all the things that hippies do to the point that with some lobbying from the Nixon uh, government, the, the government of Mexico actually shut down access for non-locals to this town from 1969 until 1976 to put a stop to this sort of threat, basically, you know, like hippies living in the woods and doing God knows what in the water. Um, and this is a problem. And so we need to address the fact that coming in as heroes or coming in that we have the new technology that can help this, that is not going to get us anywhere. And then in fact, that's the opposite track. Um, and so what we really need to look at I just want to say it did end uh, on good news, uh, which is now that Maria Sabina, though she was maligned for sort of releasing the, the, the demon, if you will, to the Westerners or releasing the children to the Westerners, she's now revered uh, as, a, as a mystic, as someone who is incredibly important, especially now that psychedelics are coming all over, uh, are, are popping up all over the world. And she is being looked to also for... Um, the the reciprocity so giving back to the communities that have had and have been using these for a very long time so some passing thoughts um i actually was going i i have a paper in my mind that i wanted to write about microtourism in particular as as this direct economic booster it's something we've been seeing uh doing this now for five years um but i thought i would just read this to you because i happened to find this when i was looking for it, it says from ancient times, nature has been a recreational space for humanity. Today, tourism represents a significant way to engage with nature and forests serve as an ideal setting for leisure, allowing for placeful aesthetic and cultural activities. Mycotourism is a forestry activity utilized to boost economic development, preserve culture and manage natural resources. Uh, the information gathered about fungi, the ability of collecting communities to manage financial support, and their connection with society will be foundational for valuing mycological resources as tourist attractions as well as for communities. Though a social and multi through a social and multidisciplinary approach, new perspectives on forests have been developed to construct sustainable development theories based on tourist management of mycological resources. Now, I think this paper then goes in to talk a lot more about what this means um but what in in oaxaca this is really on display oaxaca is is a tourist town and is known as a tourist town and central oaxaca really sucks up a lot of those tourist dollars so when you get a a tour out to urebe de agua or some of these waterfalls that are here it's a central operating tourist company that's taking you out there and bringing you back to your hotel in central Michael tourism allows us to go directly into the communities to stay with them to eat with them to spend our money directly in these communities and it's not waiting for the government to sort of hand out uh and so it really it, it changes the way that we can use tourist money to bring that directly to those communities now i know that staying at a luxury hotel isn't exactly that uh, isn't exactly that model. We're getting there. Uh, we did need to make the Mexican first Mexican Nama event very palatable, which it was. Uh, and we're getting there, I promise you. Um, I did want to talk a little bit, uh, Trent, I'm almost there wrapping up. Um, if you're not familiar with the Nagoya Protocol, this is some a thought I recently had at SOMA that really kind of blew my mind. Uh, the Nagoya Protocol is an international agreement. It aims to ensure fair and equitable use uh, and sharing of benefits for the use of genetic resources, emphasizing the rights of indigenous and local communities. Now, I should say that the most powerful word in here is AIMS, uh, because it really hasn't been used uh, to the fullest extent. Uh, in fact, only 25 countries have seen agreements uh, in which native communities are accorded benefits, um, and it's, it's, it's not being enforced very well. However, I got to 
take a look at the DNA um, sequencing uh, class that was at Soma camp recently, the Sonoma mycological event. And I'm blown away. I had no idea. You know, I, I got excited when the human genome was being mapped. I think it cost $2.7 billion to do that. Uh, and now can be done in, in 10 years and now can be done in three days. Uh, and this technology is, is, is shrinking down to the point where it could actually be utilized in these communities. It's it's vastly exceeding Moore's law. This is another exponential graph. So you can see that the cost of actually doing these DNA sequences is really, is, is come down so much that with proper training and, and the desire, some of these communities could actually be logging their own DNA sequencing for the mushrooms they're finding themselves, uh, which is pretty awesome. Considering that on one little foray, I found pretty much, I'm sure, three new Craterella species that have not been mapped. And I asked the local uh, Craterella expert uh, in Guyana if he'd ever seen these, and he said no, and you're in the arboreal forest, so probably these are our three new species. So as we're bringing more people for mycotourism, as we're finding new species, if the communities are empowered to have their own genetically identifiable machines and are able to be trained on how to do that, that strengthens that Nagoya protocol by giving them the actual discovery rights, if you will, for as far as, far as science is concerned, for the actual genetics uh, that are in their land. Um, so I keep emphasizing this point, and I just wanted to say uh, for that, that one of the things that we've noticed in Mexico is that is people are very kind and very lovely here, but if you try to force yourself on them, they don't want that. They've, they've had enough. But if you are kind and you are humble and you are uh, nerdy and geeky about mushrooms like them, you're often invited to come in. People want to exchange and they want to feel uh, a part of this. Um, so this is actually uh, some images from Alyssa Allen, who is now coming for her third year this year on some of our trips in Oaxaca, uh, giving a free class on mushroom dyeing to the Zapotec weavers and dyers in Teotitlan. Divai. And, and you know, this is a gift. It's more than free. This is a gift for the community. Uh, and now this has been repeated several times. And I wanted to teach you all your first Zapotec word. Uh, this is the word, if it will load, Galagetza. Galagetza means to give and to receive. But it does that in such a free trade kind of thing. It actually means that everything you give is being logged. And it's going to come back to you later when you need something from other people because every the community is paying attention. And so one of the things we really strive to do for every single one of our events is help if the communities want to learn cultivation, we teach cultivation. If they want to learn more about using mushrooms for dying, we go out of our way to, to bring that to them and to make sure they have that. Showing different cooking techniques or different ideas, laying out an ID table uh, and, and doing in Spanish, uh, telling them about the mushroom identification and the varieties they have uh, as an exchange is, is for being able to have access to these incredible uh, preserved forests and these incredible uh, areas um, that we have been granted access to, you know, and we have friends now in several different of the mountain ranges in several different states. Um, and I feel like we're still just getting started and it's just so exciting. Um, so thank you all so much. This, uh, you can visit the fungivore.com. Uh, we have several tours this year, including the Nama MX, which is really exciting. The only one, uh, well, actually we're doing one in Chiapas as well, but mostly we do in Oaxaca and that will be in the state of Mexico, which I've been talking about. Uh, you guys have been great. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I will um, keep this up for a second and check on the Q&A and see if there's any answers. Trent, maybe Trent, you can help me with anything in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have about a half a dozen questions here lined up from the chat um, and, and some from the Q&A as well. So uh, right off the bat, uh, what's that potato man that smells like a loon, sounds like a loon in the background we keep hearing? There was oh, a so it's, so there's, it's a sweet potato steaming pressure steamer. Uh, and when the potatoes are done, he releases the pressure and it blows a big whistle. And you know that it's it's time to go get your hot potatoes. <laughs> I, I've never I didn't know they were on the beach. They're usually in Mexico City uh, and in Oaxaca as well. Um, can you leave all the Excellent. Links? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, we had questions to get some links, especially the uh, the one to the 3D yeah um, absolutely uh, animation if you could drop that into the chat yeah. and then the yeah. other one was on the video about distillation okay and uh pretty much the fungivore everything if everyone has that i'm gonna stop my sharing uh so i can 
go yeah. and find those links and share those for y'all. Um, yeah, a lot of the scholarly articles um, you might have to seek out, but uh, I don't, I don't, I sort of have them downloaded. I don't necessarily have the links in particular to them, but I will definitely put the 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 maps to tennis chitlan is is absolutely stunning. Thank you. Um, so let me find that. And if uh, anyone else has any questions in the meantime, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I can keep a few more flowing to you from. Okay, great. From there, meanwhile, too. Uh, Gary Gilbert asked about vouchering and wanted some details on 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 how how vouch, voucher samples are shared locally and how they get back to the U.S. or if they do. Well, we're we're working on that. Um, they are in order to even create a legal voucher sample in Mexico, there's a whole bunch of hoops you have to jump through, including having a uh, mycologist who is, is uh, already legal to be collecting samples in that area for science. Uh, and in order to collect in an area, you actually have to have permission of the communities, uh, not only to enter their land, but even to take anything off of their land. Uh, and so um, the Mazawa community, San Antonio, was a little bit more relaxed about it. Oxtotilpan was very clear that they wanted a species list, uh, which we're still working on um, just to get, make sure that we have exactly the right species. Uh, there were two uh, two or three samples of each mushroom collected with the idea that half of the dried um, collection, well, actually all of the dried collection would be going to UNAM first. And then the Chicago Field Museum will request uh, to borrow or to have on loan half of the collection, which would be uh, the equal collection, basically. Um, I wasn't actually super involved in the vouchering or in the vouchering discussions, which kind of happened in that email chain um, sidestep to me. Um, but I know that... Uh, Andrew, what is his name? Sorry, I'm thinking about Mexico. Uh, the the main the main guy from the Chicago Field Museum was in conversations with Roberto Garibay at UNAM, who does a lot of the work there, as well as with the Mexican Herbarium uh, as well. And I think we're going to have a lot more, uh, a much more streamlined um, experience of that this year because we were kind of all learning uh, all on the ground at once. Okay. Uh, two more I got here. Uh, one is about wheat lacoche. Um, is there any of that going on down there? Do you have any comments? We haven't been to uh, any farms to see it, but it's it's everywhere. Uh, you can always buy it year round. It's always around in every market. It's, it's absolutely easy to find. You know, the equivalent of Safeway sells it. Uh, it's a very common ingredient. Um, and uh, I guess this year when we grow corn, maybe we'll try to uh, I did try to spread some of the spores on some of our corn silks last year, but it didn't do anything. So <laughs> I'll try again. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, it's very common. Wheat Lakota is, is very common. And side note, I just learned that the the real name for poinsettias is actually Wheat Lazochil, um, which is, and is an Aztec flower that was uh, pirated and taken back to the U.S. by a white supremacist named Poinsett. Uh, and, and the rest is history, folks. So if you can say, Huitla Coche, then you can say Huitla Zochil, and that is the new name mm -hmm. that you should be calling Poinsettias. <laughs> All right. Um, Becca, I put the uh, Tenet Chitlan chat in the Q&A. Um, looks like we've got some other open questions here. Da -da -da -da. Uh, um, oh, yeah, there's some more Q&A coming over there. Meanwhile, excellent. So people are dropping those in. Do you want to pick those out and answer them? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, one is, uh, will this recording be posted? Um, so yes, this, the recording will be up on what the NAMA webs, the NAMA webinar, web we have a webinar page and it will be posted on there, uh, within the week. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. How can we start and foster relations with the indigenous communities living around us? I mean, go say hi. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I mean, I don't know where you live and I don't know the, the politics of that particular area, uh, Gabriel, but um, I think that, you know, curiosity, humbleness is, is always a good start. And um, you could even start by saying, hey, I saw this presentation on Mexico and there was a lot of highlights about indigenous communities. And I, I am really inspired to to change my viewpoints or I'm not sure how you would how you'd approach that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it depends on where you live and, and I would start asking questions about with the folks that are that are local to you um, and see what's around you. And I, I would love that. I think that would be phenomenal. I know there's, um, what's the, 
there's been some movements recently. We were just reading about the show Reservation Dogs, which I haven't, uh, I hadn't heard before. But it's you know the first all Native American acting, directing, uh, and production team. So I think there's some movement all around the world for indigenosity. Um, Mexico's kind of got a head start um, for some reasons that I won't go into now. Um, but yeah, I, I please let me know how that goes. I, I would I would love to know more. Uh, Glenn, are mycological groups in Mexico engaged with any issues to do with timber sales or other economically impactful interventions? Can you speak of those going for them currently? I'm asking from the perspective of being in the mycological sites facing the same issues. Um, well, it depends state by state. It's it's similar to the U.S., right? So in Oaxaca, uh, something like um, 470 of the 540 municipalities, counties, if you will, are indigenous controlled and autonomous and control their own forest resources. Um, the Mancomunados, which is a, a group here in Oaxaca of, uh, in the Sierra Nortes, actually has their own timber company and they are harvesting uh, trees that have the bark beetle in them actually and have been successfully running a sustainable timber company for some time. Um, there is obviously just like everywhere there was a massive logging and some there's there's not a lot of old growth forest it is almost all second growth uh, forest at this point although um, some of it is a lot more diverse uh, than others. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure on 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 the larger political views of things. Uh, and again, it does vary from state to state and from north to south. Um, Bill, you asked about safety. Yes, the U.S. loves to tell you all of the ways that Mexico can kill you. <laughs> um, there is, as far as I know, there's there's. It's pretty rare for Americans to actually be targeted. Uh, by even the Mexican gangs in the worst parts, only because it brings on the full weight of the of of the um, of the U.S. government, which is, is tries to be avoided. But down in Oaxaca, in Valle de Bravo, uh, even in Mexico City, it's really it's it's like any other city. I mean, it, it's you'd be hard pressed to find a difference uh, than from New York or Philadelphia or anywhere else. There are parts of the city you definitely don't want to go to, and there are parts of the city that are are popping until four in the morning uh with you know drunk folks wandering home um you know it's like anywhere if you're in the city you need to watch yourself if you're in the country it's probably a lot more safe um but uh, the cartels are are really border border issues more than anything i mean you there are certain states that are are controlled by them and i may be answering this as an ignorant uh, North American that does not know the extent to which Mexicans are suffering under the cartels. Um, you know, and that's, that's my own ignorance and, and my own non-exposure. As we learn more Spanish, we are learning more politics. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I living here in Mexico, I feel a little more dangerous when I, or more endangered when I'm in the U S because you never know where there's going to be somebody with a gun. Um, so, yeah, I think it's all perspective uh, and and the news that you that you absorb. Um, can you show the sequencing screen for a few seconds so I can take photos? Maybe let me see what I can do there. Sequencing screen. Which one was that? Let's see. That was kind of near the end, right? It was one of the last half dozen yeah, slides. Yeah. You you don't need me to tell you about your slides, do you? Right. Probably not. <laughs> um, sure. Is this the screen you're talking about? Let's see. That's for Heidi. Hopefully she can answer. Take a screenshot. While that's up there and maybe getting ready for the next one, um, and maybe she's doing her screenshot here. There was one uh, on the mycophagy slide uh, that looked like there were reishi growing up on the ceiling or the floor with lights around them uh oh right what was that what was that, that? Was, uh, that uh was uh at a restaurant in mexico city called tenqui tenqui is the nawal name for mushroom uh and they grow mushrooms upstairs they have a bunch of conks as their light covers uh, all over their wall all of their art is mushrooms they have mushroom infused mezcal all of their dishes are mushrooms and it is a fine dining restaurant and it's in the it's in one of the it's one of the top restaurants in Mexico City right now. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Rodrigo uh, was the chef at the time. He's now been actually promoted to the manager of the restaurant group, uh, for whatever that means. Um, but there's yeah, there the fine dining in Mexico City is phenomenal, and okay. they really you know there's actually four times as many restaurants in Mexico City as in 
New York. <laughs> so is Manhattan. So um, it is it is a, a very gastronomic forward city. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Patricia Patricia asked if you could put the name of the Mexico City restaurant. Could you type that into the chat? Oh, yeah. Of course, of course. I'm going to type in the Q&A. Is that all right? Um, I don't. Uh, I think people see that if you type it in. I don't know if only she sees it or everybody sees it. It's in the answered part. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's okay. see. Uh, John, uh, well, the thing is, John, there's not a lot of Europeans going into these communities. That's the thing is you, you don't just get to go wherever you want in Mexico. Um, and so there isn't really a lot of problems with Europeans eating fungi um commonly accepted as edible in fact i've eaten far more mushrooms now in mexico than i ever ate in the u.s such as the uh, turbinellus flaccus or flaccosis they um you know i haven't i never really made a practice of eating lacaria they eat quite a bit of romaria here which i was never sure of which ones to eat as well and i haven't had any issues we do warn people on our tours that if you are going to eat a bunch of new edible mushrooms just you know be careful um because you never know you know there's there are allergies there are sensitivities and things um that happen um but uh yeah i mean a lot of people get gastronomical distress here but i don't think you have to eat mushrooms to have that in mexico um so um yeah i don't i don't think there's a lot of you know, maybe in several years we're gonna get uh you know like people like oh i heard that these guys eat this one raw and then maybe we'll have some trouble but i don't think that's it's pretty it's this pretty compartmentalized knowledge at this point um but as always it's good to eat what you're familiar with and not others you're welcome patricia all right um, Donna Kurt asked about a sequencer setup cost. I don't know if that's an area you have any knowledge in. Um, I uh, do not, although I'd heard that it is now around four to six hundred dollars to have your full home sequencing um, kit. And I think that's for the first sequence. Uh, it looks like the actual medium that you use to separate out the DNA can be expensive, um, more expensive, I should say. But it's, you know, several hundreds of dollars now versus you know several millions of dollars and can sequence so much faster it's absolutely fascinating i definitely get involved in in uh touch with um oh man i can't remember his name Hart. harp yes harp Hart or steven miller stephen stephen yeah, miller harp, harp, harp is who taught the class um that i took at soma and and sort of demonstrating what was possible uh and i was blown away i just it's all above my head i think i i'm just I didn't even know how PCR worked and now I'm like just even more amazed by humans. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I check out Harp Singer and, and yeah, you know, honestly, I, I know some people are averse to, to AI, but chat GPT has a lot to say about things that are science-based and you can really ask specific questions and, and get some answers yeah. from that. And NAMA also has a uh, DNA sequencing committee. It's oh, very cool. active. They've got a lot going on. Oh, great. Um, these people you just mentioned are, are involved. So if anybody does want to find out more, uh, we could probably put you in touch with the committee that could help you with some resources there. Um, I would say come to some of these events because often there's a whole sequencing track going on at, at some of the better mushroom events because uh, it's such a such a hot topic. Uh, I got a question for you. Um, this is from me. I noticed pictures in there of people with a lot of a lot of times your 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 attendees were wearing long sleeves. And I've had people ask me, like, why would I go to Mexico in August? It's going to be really hot. But when you're at this elevation, t t tell me about the weather people should expect in August. Well, in general, actually, August is not hot here. August is when it's cloudy and rainy and the monsoons come in. And, um, you know, in Oaxaca, it, it rarely gets above 70 five degrees during rainy season and can get down to I mean, we it, the coldest it's gotten is, is in the dry season and it gets into the high 30s. That's Fahrenheit, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it's rainy season. You're, it, it, there's a lot of times when if you're from Oregon, you're like, am I in Oregon right now? Like, what is going on? I mean, it's not Oregon mushroom season. It's warmer than that, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, like in the Sierra Sur here in Oaxaca, it gets cold at night. I mean, you're in the clouds. It's a cloud forest. So there are rain clouds rolling right by and, and everything is getting misty and wet. Um, so yeah, it's really not uh, August, maybe on the coast, but even then it's, it's more rainy and monsoony as well. Um, so, you know, but Mexico does get hurricanes. So, you know, don't, don't go to the beach on hurricane season. <laughs> I don't know if anyone saw that uh, last year, the, the one that hit Acapulco that went from a 
tropical storm to a category five in 12 hours or something. Um, but that gave us some rain. So that was cool. And in, in the valleys. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to say, uh, I, I think we're out of questions here. Um, I would like to remind everybody if you're, if you're interested, we saw uh, your, your website address up there. Mm -hmm. If you want to say that for everybody, we also have it NAMA. Uh, we, you can, you can get in through that route and fill out your, your application for um, the 2024 NAMA 4A. Uh, tell everybody your website again though. And why don't you wrap us up with a, with a goodbye? Yeah. Awesome. I just threw that in the chat. Um, that's the direct link to the NAMA page as well. Um, but the fungivore.com that's us. And, uh, thank you guys so much for sticking it out with me. Sorry. It went a little over longer than an hour. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, info at the fungivore, um, we, I, I'm always happy to chat with other, other micro geeks and whatnot. And if you're coming to Oaxaca, you know, or Mexico and have some questions, feel free to message me too. I love sharing this. Uh, this amazing country with folks. So awesome. Thank you, Morgan. Appreciate you. that. All right. Lots of thank yous coming in. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Zach. We really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Yeah, and, man. Uh, I hope to have you back again soon. See you soon. All right. Bye, Trent. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>